Jax. Um, my name is Mishfa, and uh, this is Kofa. This is. Sorry? This is my phone. Oh, no. oh. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's uh, great to be here at. Uh... Um, this was not on. I think it's on. Is it on? Yeah, it's on. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here at Rejects. Uh, my name is Vashwa, and I'm hey. joined with my co-founder, Ankur. We are the co-founders of Zenuni. Between us, we have about 25 years of site reliability engineering uh, experience. We're working on an end-to-end -end instant management platform specifically designed for uh, infrastructure engineers that are cloud-native. We help them manage their major incidents whenever there's any kind of downtime, making sure that uh, they get alerted and they have uh, an instant response orchestration uh, framework in place so that they're able to recover their systems uh, within uh, SLA timeframes. Uh, so while we help uh, our customers manage downtime, today is not about incidents, it's not about downtime, it's about exploring some of our own mistakes. Uh, a lot has changed in the last uh, 12 to 18 months. We are no longer in the zero interest uh, rate phenomenon uh, cycle. A lot of companies have sort of started to look very closely at uh, where their costs are going, where their infrastructure costs are going, and uh, they're looking at optimizing their costs. Uh, this is a story about something, a few of the mistakes that we made that costed us dearly a long time back, um, and it has, it has got to do with uh, an implementation of Thanos that we did. Uh, we had implemented Thanos um, to, to make sure that, uh, you know, we, we are able to monitor all of our production metrics in a, in a reliable, fast way. Uh, we also explored a lot, many other uh, platforms like, like Victoria Metrics, Cortex. Uh, we'll also explore what specific mistakes we made, how our setup was, what our architecture looked like. Uh, we look at the good, bad, and the ugly of our uh, monitoring and observability setup. And then we look at how it ended up, how a few mistakes uh, ended up amplifying themselves and uh, ended up costing us quite a lot. So why did we need Thanos in the first place? Basically, we, Prometheus actually did a decent job of, of you know, tracking our, our measurements, but at some point, at some scale, it was, it was not coming good, right? It, uh, uh, we needed something that helped us store petabytes of historical data uh, in a reliable and cost-efficient way. Um, without sacrificing you know, uh, response query times. We wanted to access data from multiple Prometheus servers in a, in a, in a single UI uh, to be able to collect and replicate data from uh, HA setups. Thanos pretty much fit the bill. We did explore a bunch of other things. Uh, it, was, it was simple, it was reliable. Uh, and uh, there, were, there were basically four or five things that we were looking at uh, when we were exploring Thanos. One is that we needed something uh, called the, uh, the global query view, wherein we're able to uh, query data from uh, a Prometheus setup that is uh, functionally shorted uh, to be able to access all of the data through an API or a UI to be able to render multiple queries in our visualization tool, which was, which was Kripana. Um, and uh, Thanos pretty much helped us do that. We were able to query and aggregate data from multiple Prometheus servers, and it was available from a single endpoint. Um, it was also pretty reliable when it comes to historical data storage. As a company, we, uh, we, we, our customers need us to, to store data uh, in the short term and in the long term, and, and Thanos pretty much fit the bill there as well. Downsampling was something that, uh, that was also something that we needed uh, from a cost perspective and, and also from a, uh, uh, from a, from a, from a sto historical storage perspective, right? To be able to downsize all of our data, downsample all of our data, uh, historical data, and to be able to visualize, that, uh, visualize all of that later. And then higher availability was something that, that's, that was pretty much a, a no-brainer for us, right? So Prometheus had an HA model that independently collected the data. Uh, it, was, it was quite simple, but when you merged and deduplicated the views, um, Thanos provided a huge improvement when it comes to uh, usability. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of our solutions, a lot of other solutions that we had considered uh, had a few caveats. Which be, I'll just discuss those caveats in, a, in, a, in, a, in just a minute. So one is that uh, you know, we needed something that supported uh, PromQL uh, that had good community support. 
a lot of these tools have one or the other, but but not all of that as well, right? So this is this was our Thanos uh, implementation. Uh, if if you if you have or uh, if you may or may not have worked on Thanos, works as a sidecar to uh, Prometheus. Uh, it, 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 it basically pushes all of the, the data to our, uh, an object storage solution, in which in our case was uh, S3. Uh, we had implemented Prove uh, Prometheus uh, function starting in the HA mode, uh, which means that we were scraping all of the data twice from different uh, availability zones. Uh, the setup also required that we have Thanos ruler uh, set from two equations, which then sort of moved it to our alerting layer, which was alert manager, the Prometheus alert, uh, alert manager. And from alert manager, it will go to all the incident management or Slack and uh, other alerting solutions, right? Uh, we had Thanos Query that uh, uses the storage gateway uh, to get all data from the object storage, and then it's used by our internal teams to, to make sure that you know, they have all the data to run any of their own analysis, even our product managers use it as well. And in order to get faster query data, and uh, even in terms of retention, we have the Thanos Compactor that is used to downsample the data and store it back to the, to the object storage. So this was... This is a setup for mistake number one. This was our, our, our architecture. And then for mistake number two, there was uh, concerns log aggregation. We had Fluentbit uh, that, that basically aggregated all of our logs uh, used for Kubernetes. We uh, deployed a daemon set and uh, started exporting all of the logs to open search. So a lot of the data was coming through here, which, which, which aggregated the, the cost at some point, which uh, my colleague Ankur will, will, will cover shortly. Oh. One small bit to the story that he's going to tell you is that we also use the we also uh, added the, those logs with uh, Kubernetes data, so that involved calling the Kubernetes API, and if the API failed, uh, it does it did a little bit of retry with some Jitter logic before the, uh, pushing the data back to, uh, to the, uh, the destination. Our expectation was pretty straightforward that we you know we'll have all of our data in one place. It was it would be reliable. It would be easy to query, uh, clean our metrics right, and we thought it would work without a hiccup. Um, that was, in retrospect, a little naive. Uh, not really. Um, we, we made some basic errors uh, in, in, in our network topology. Uh, Ankur will cover that shortly. Um, we also did not have any control over the cardinality. Um, way to metrics were, were being monitored and uh, were being scraped, uh, considering our scale. And we should have had a little more control over that. That was mistake number two. Uh, and then downsampling. There was, a, there was a configuration error in, in the downsampling that again aggravated our, 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 our costs. So it was basically three, three different, different mistakes, all of them amplifying each other and then turned into a massive snowball. So, yeah. uh, <clears throat> Thanks, Mr. Shah. So if you see, this is a normal VPC configuration, usually looks like, but uh, in our setup, but we, were, but we were discounting in these things like that, there were too much of uh, too, too much of a network traffic between two different regions, okay? And when that happens, it happens through an egress, which happens through NAT gateway, which is a costly object from the AWS, right? We also, so what, what happened here was all our, since he has already mentioned that for Prometheus, we were actually scraping twice to actually have a HA, and our object storage being S3, so all the data which was being pushed to S3 was happening through NAT gateway. And during downsampling also, we were actually downloading the same data and sending it back, which resulted in the first step of mistake. So how did we fix it? So uh, we had to actually use NAT gateway, but we have a VPC gateway endpoint in middle to actually uh, separate our public and private uh, request. So in this, we were able to, whatever internal queries which actually goes to S3, we were able to route through VPC gateway and fix this problem. Uh, second one, like uh, high cardinality, so what is high cardinality? So if, if you're actually defining the metrics, although Prometheus is really uh, scalable and it can handle millions of metrics, right? But it's always good to consider high cardinality when you're actually setting up Prometheus metrics. Reason being, you should not be selecting metrics which are fast changing. Just to give you an example, you will never set up a metrics based on timestamp because it's changing every second. Similarly, a pod name should be fine because I don't think uh, there will be application which are scaling like every minute. The port name needs to stay there for at least two days. This is fine. But other example would be, for example, uh, you should not be, if, if a person is logging in, your users are logging in from multiple sessions, right? 
it's good to actually monitor their user email or maybe user ID and not the session ID. Because if the user starts logging in from multiple sources, it will increase the cardinality. So in our case, uh, so this, this, we, this problem was there, but this has not costed us much, but we actually, when we were analyzing our bigger issue, we have identified, okay, this could also lead to another problem. So we have fixed it uh, when we got to this problem. Uh, and the third being the biggest culprit is downsampling. Uh, so our use case, I'll, I'll actually explain to you what our use case is, but I'll explain to you what downsampling is. So uh, downsampling is uh, simply uh, reducing the sample size as in in, a prom in our Prometheus setup, what we were doing is we're actually sampling the data based on every five seconds. But since our teams have a different use cases, like some teams require data of, for one week or some teams require data for one month and some, some teams prefer to actually keep data for a year or even longer than that. But it's, it's not advised to actually keep that big data, the, the kind of data which we have in your S3 storage and keep transferring that data again and again. So we use downsampling and how it is done is when instead of a five second window, when we were moving to uh, a week's data, we actually downsample it to 10 minutes. So in a 10 minute window, what it will do is actually uh, the objects, the object data object which, which is calibrated takes the average of different metrics. In our case, it was of minimum, maximum timestamps and create lesser objects, but it will be relevant to give you the, uh, the metrics which you want, okay? If you see uh, the settings which we had with our Prometheus was, our, uh, the raw data retention was for 40 days, okay? And then these settings, which is a limitation of a Thanos compactor also, that it only gives you option of downsampling it with five minutes or one hour. So we were using that initially that with five minutes we'll have a retention of 180 days and the other one will be one hour. In this one more limitation which is there is to actually downsample it to five minutes and one hour, we have to keep our raw data also. That means the raw data needs to be there until and unless we downsample this. Or we actually start downsampling it at the starting point, which will again the data transfer will again be there. And to solve this problem, what we did was we actually wrote our own compactor because Thanos at this at that particular time did not have the option of actually customizing based on what, what we needed. So this is what we came up. We actually created uh, our own compactor, uh, which we are planning to open source it. Currently, it works uh, very fine with Prometheus, and we are testing it with Victoria Metrics also. So we'll be making it public and make it available for everyone for the community. Uh, so this is the configuration which we have done at our setup, that the raw data should only stay there for three days. After that, the data should be deleted, considering it has downsampled to the 10 minute window, which will have a retention of 180 days. Again, now the next downsampling which needs to happen, we don't have to keep the raw data. What we can do is, we can use the downsampled data of 10 minutes window and do a 30 minutes resolution. And whenever we are doing it in our compactor, what we have given is option of deleting the previous data. So once you have downsampled from 30 days, you can actually delete the 10 minute downsampled data as well. Okay, this is, this is wrong, this should not be four, four days. I think wrong screenshot came in. So this should have been three days. And the other option which we have give, given is the resolution start date. So in Thanos, there was a limitation that it will start after a particular day, but we have given the freedom for the users to actually start the downsampling at, a at their convenience, but this needs to be before the raw data gets deleted. So this is how we have, we have been able to actually solve this problem. Uh, so uh, like, like Vishwa, my colleague mentioned, right? So this is another case which is not related to Thanos. Uh, I'll tell you the story behind this. Actually, the, the data which was collected by the Thanos downsample was in the range of TBs, okay? It was, it, we, we got alert at the earlier stage in some TB and when we were actually fixing it and downsample it and we identified the, our alert, the alert which we have misconfigured at a higher value, we should have it at a lower value. And when we did that, we, when we were able to solve the Thanos problem, we identified who is the second bigger, com, the culprit, right? And that time we were like, okay, we are getting some more application data, maybe there is a usage, but it was exponentially increasing for a few hours which we monitored. And that time we have identified that it was related to our Fluent Bit. So we are using Fluent Bit to actually aggregate our application logs. And uh, how do we do that? We actually, uh, 
do, do it to actually tail our application logs. And then we are using Kubernetes API to attach some uh, infra level metrics. For example, we're querying to attach pod name, some other will be timestamps, some other services which we only can get it from the pod to, to from the Kubernetes. The problem with this is uh, if Kubernetes API fails, it keeps trying for the data, right? And it goes into an infinite loop, which leads to error being concatenated every step. So in, in most of our logs, it was working fine. And why it was not caught in the earlier stage? Because uh, one of the newer services which was released, uh, in that we have actually included a subpath which was working in the local environment and not working in the production environment. And that is why from that point of view, that, that point of time, what we have done is uh, we have started reviewing our infra pushes also, like we do our application pushes. And uh, those subpath error caused the QBI, Kubernetes API error, which resulted in those errors being mounted. And later on, this data which gets, in our case, it was getting pushed to CloudWatch, and that alarm got triggered when we actually fixed the Thanos alert, okay? So uh, these are two use cases which actually occurred to us, and we thought it will be good to share it. But sometimes, but in the retrospect, which we think about it, how bad it could be? These are logs, right? These are data. In our case, uh, we were running six to seven. Okay, oh, just a minute. So I'm actually giving you an estimation of how we are calculating. So. In our case, the NAT gateway was processing 50 terabytes of data for the logs. And this, this data is only spanned over one month, uh, which is 730 hours. So the NAT, the gateway hourly cost, which will be come to $32, not much. But if we go to the data transfer processing cost, it will come to $2,300. And then uh, if you calculate it, it's $2,333. But we had six such NAT gateways because we have a multiple region setup. So this is $14,000, but adding to that, if we calculate the fluent bit uh, data, which was around 100 GB, it would have come to uh, somewhere around $1,700. But again, we have uh, six to seven clusters of this, which will add up to 100K. But fortunately, uh, this was caught much before, so it, was, it, it could have led to our 100K spending. But what happened was, our, so we did not have any alert on the uh, data ingestion. But we had an alert on our cost usage. So when AWS detected that we are crossing our cost within a one week of the month, which, which is our usual monthly bill, so they alerted us. And we were like, we have not, and we were checking our EC2 instances, RDS. That's the first thing you will check, right? Because these are the, the highly cost effective things. And that's why it took us more than half an hour to identify the major culprit is the data and not the uh, instances. And when we caught it, uh, when we, when we caught that uh, error, we actually went back and we actually stopped the Thanos for some time to actually see what, what the real, use, real solution could be because our dependence on Thanos was real. We cannot actually, uh, in, in our research, what we have found out, we actually needed Thanos. And it's not like by shutting down Thanos will solve the problem. So we had to find a solution which led us to actually writing our own uh, downsampler compactor. Okay. Uh, with, like, like I said, with prop so after the first monitoring setup, right, I was able to detect the second error, which could have come into picture sometime later and maybe some more dollars will be spent, but we were able to detect that. So in our company, what we do is uh, we, are, we are okay to make mistakes, but at least learn from it and not make the same mistake. And the reason why we are here is we, are not, we, we don't want others to make the same mistake which we are doing. Uh, Final words, uh, the smallest mistakes are the hardest to find because nobody is looking into it. Like in our case also, when the cost came in, we were looking into the EC2 instance and not the data. Uh, don't rush into the things. It's all, means I know uh, when, when you get a hold of a new tool or new bike, you would want to actually take it to the road and go for a spin, right? But make sure you actually test it properly based on your use cases. Run it in a sub-production environment to uh, validate your hypothesis and other metrics also. And if you are a growing build fast, break fast team, it's often worth spending on excessive monitoring and alerting. Because if you don't have that, you may end up actually getting to know in the later stage and not in the earlier stage. 
thank you for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, you can ask us or you can meet us at the KubeCon booth also. Uh, and we would love to actually hear stories from you. We, if you can actually come to our booth and share your stories also, or here also, if we'd love to hear. Stories. I mean, this is just a small, maybe like three mistakes of <laughs> thousands and thousands of mistakes that all of us make. Yeah. If you have interesting <laughs> stories, you know, we're all here. We have a lot of time, actually. Feel <laughs> free to share your stories here. Love to, love to hear them. Yeah. Uh, if you're going to KubeCon, we are at booth and 35. Yeah, we Thank you. yeah we have ten minutes. Anybody have any questions or stories? No stories. <laughs> you can you can mask the company name if you want. I mean, if you cover by NDA, then we can understand. Right? <laughs> we can ask them to stop the recording also if you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.